All right, welcome. Can we get a round of applause? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, welcome all to uh, what is already a fantastic occasion. I'm so honored to be here, so honored to be speaking with you all. Uh, my name is Brandon Wint. I work with Massey Art Society and Massey Books in order to bring events like this uh, to our community. And so welcome, it's my honor to welcome you to uh, It Stops Here with Ruben George and guests. Yeah, round of applause for that. So yeah, you're all doing a great job. Just, uh, you know, find your seats as I talk, get comfortable. You know, this is about, this is about listening, this is about offering, this is about community. So uh, take your time. I'm just gonna be on stage just to like, do a little bit of housekeeping before we get to the, uh, the more fun parts, you know? And so I'll just say that, uh, again, my name is Brandon Wint. I work with Massey Art Society and Massey Books. Uh, and it's my absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, this event will go from roughly 6.30 to 9 o'clock, but like, you know, that sounds formal, and it is, but like, you know, like make yourself comfortable, you know, stretch, move around, you know, respectfully, you know, be a human in the space, stretch your legs if you need to walk around, use the bathroom, that's all good. Uh, speaking of bathrooms, which I won't do too much of, uh, there are two bathrooms, one located on the third floor and one located on the second floor. They are gender neutral uh, and all the bathroom stalls are accessible. Um, I should also note that you might have already seen, but this event is being recorded and live streamed and photographed. Uh, so, you know, if you want to be a superstar, you know, tonight might be your night to, uh, <laughs> you know, make your appearance on, 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 a, on a camera. Um, I should also say, uh, we ask that you please try to keep uh, noise to a minimum and please turn off your sound devices. So like, you know, this might be the moment to like click off your cell phone or, you know, uh, things of that nature. Uh, following the conversation between Ruben George, Michael Smith, and Andrea Croson, uh, um, there will be an audience Q&A. Uh, the volunteers from the SFU will bring microphones to folks. If you have questions, uh, just raise your hands and we'll bring a microphone to you. Uh, in terms of the sort of spirit and energy of the Q&A, uh, you know, we want to welcome a healthy, open dialogue that's productive in the spirit of openness. Uh, we want to keep the conversation, you know, lively but respectful. Um, and then after that, after that, we will have a book signing. Uh, books will be available for purchase and the signing will take place on the ground floor. And then uh, finally, in terms of what, what I have in my notes, we need to thank our partners. So those are Massey Books, Massey Art Society, SFU Library, SFU Public Square, and also uh, thank you to the technical team who's already done so much great work and will continue to do so much great work uh, throughout the event. Um, can I tell a story? I know, I know I said I was gonna keep my comments brief, some people are like, no, don't tell a story. Please, please. It's about my grandma. <laughs> um, so I'm making a film right now that is uh, about the matriarchs in my family, about the history of my family uh, through my, my matriarchal line. And so I'm learning a lot about uh, my motherland, which is Barbados. Uh, one of the things that I've learned about Barbados recently uh, is that it is uh, the site of one of the most, like, rapacious colonial processes uh, in the world. So uh, when the British arrived in, in Barbados, uh, they basically decimated the place and then brought my ancestors, enslaved Africans, uh, into Barbados. And basically the entire society of Barbados was a slave, a slave society. So like nothing happened in Barbados uh, that wasn't in some way related to uh, slavery and extraction on behalf of the British. Uh, but then, when I was interviewing my grandma for the sake of this film, uh, one thing I learned was my great-grandmother's name, uh, which I did not know. So I want to uh, honor my great-grandmother, whose name is Christiana Haynes. And one thing I learned about her uh, is that she was renowned in her area of Barbados for being a, a midwife. And so uh, it was a blessing this week to learn that I come from uh, life-giving life -giving people. 
and the, oh, thank <laughs> and the the only reason the only reason I bring that up is because it feels relevant in the sense that uh, you know the very the very building that we're in right now uh, you know for a certain amount of time was funded by uh, a mining company whose name I won't mention uh, but it's just to say that it's just to say that yeah boo boo yeah that <laughs> we welcome those boos uh, but it's just to say it's just to say that you know uh, the specter of violence is always around it's always here you know even even if we gather in good intentions like we are tonight you know uh, violence is never far away uh, but it is possible still you know as in the case of Barbados as in the case of my beautiful motherland to affirm life even in the specter of, of you know violence and so personally I want to say that uh, for me I hope that this event affirms life affirms the iter iterative process of justice and so uh, I hope I hope that you will offer what you offer in that spirit as well. So that's all for me. That's all for me. Oh, okay. Thank you. So now it is uh, my honor and pleasure to welcome our two co-hosts for the evening, uh, Cedar George Parker and Kaya George. I'm going to introduce uh, Cedar first. Cedar is from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. He started his pursuit for a cleaner, safer, and brighter future for our world and environment in the fight against the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Surviving a school shooting, Cedar was witness to terror, but, but a terror to motivate him to create change. Cedar's history and years of experience of work revolve around land, water, air protection, rooted in, in being part of many key projects around the world campaigning for Mother Earth and many different ecosystems, environments, and waterways. From divestment and political awareness campaigns in Paris, France, to representing his indigenous nations in the United Nations on many occasions, from allying with organizations and indigenous nations in the Amazon to standing with relatives in Standing Rock in the United States, from lecture halls and classrooms to legislative and capital buildings, Cedar's voice, work, and advocacy continue to be heard and witnessed. Round of applause for Cedar. <laughs> and our other co-host is uh, Kaya George. Kaya is a youth indigenous environmental leader, activist, filmmaker, and student. She has traveled globally advocating for envir environmental and indigenous rights, most notably having spoken on a panel, panel in Geneva, Switzerland, at the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Kaya carries the teachings of her Tulalip and uh, Slave Tooth Nations and has been on the front lines fighting against Trans Mountain Pipeline for more than half of her life. Her work has been recognized in various publications. She was recently featured on the cover of the Globe and Mail, where she puts a spotlight on the cultural connections her people have to the southern, southern resident orca whales. She recently co-wrote, directed, and produced a short film entitled Our Grandmother, The Inlet, a film that shares the intrinsic connection the slave tooth people have to the so-called Berard Inlet. It premiered at the Vancouver International Film Festival. She is currently doing an environmental research internship with Clear Sea Center for Responsible Marine Shipping and is the lead for an indigenous initiative being launched as part of Vancouver becoming a restorative city through a collective called Peace of Circle. She does this work while continuing to study linguistics and psychology at Simon Fraser University. Join me in welcoming our co-MCs for the evening, Kaya and Cedar. Let me fix this real quick. <laughs> yeah, wow, what a, what a beautiful day. What an what a awesome day, you know, to, to all come together like this. And um, geez, you know, I'm, I'm going to start with this. Like, uh, I, I remember growing up, and um, no matter where we were, no matter what we were doing, no matter, no matter what financial situation we were in, you know, my dad was always rich, but rich with culture. Rich, rich with teachings, and, and, and I remember no matter what, he would, with whatever money we had or whatever we can cultivate together, 
I grew up watching him give it all to the longhouse or give it all to the sweat lodge, give it all to the ceremony. And, and I remember seeing that no matter what he had. And, and I would sit there and I'd watch that and, and it tripped me out. You know, because it's, um, it's beautiful, right? And, and it's different from what we see in the Western world where people take, right? We, we, we take and take and take and take and take. It's an addiction, right? I, uh, you know, my, um, I remember I was with my dad and Leonard Crowdog, and he said, take a, take a feather, and you'll see the truth and reality of somebody. You go like that, right? You'll see the truth and reality of them. And so I remember that teaching to my dad, and, and we're able to pass it down to my little brother who's 13. And we're driving on the downtown east side, and we talk about addiction, the spirit of addiction and how powerful it is. And the, the, the addiction of money, too, and how powerful it is. And we're driving to the downtown east side. I said, my little brother, what do you see? And he, he said what he saw. And I said, now take the feather. He saw it. And he's like, for their addiction to get what they're trying to get, they, uh, they probably hurt their family and steal a little bit from time to time, right? And then I took him to the financial district downtown. And I said, hold this feather. And, and, and what do you see? My little brother knows what the mining companies are doing in Nevada, you know, my little brother knows that the mining companies are destroying the land and the, and, and the people, usually where native people are. My little brother knows what pipelines are doing to the people and to the land and to the air. You know, he, he's around us, you know. And my dad drives him in the, in the convertible and goes fishing with him and he loves it. And, and uh, my little brother fixes my dad's stuff and they, they, they love it, you know, they're, they're cute. And, and so he knows what it looks like. He's been to Line 3, TMX. He's been to all these things. And uh, he said, now, now, now what do you see? Oh, I got a little stain. Hey. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, we're dri they're driving. And I said, what do you see in, over here downtown where the money is? Millionaires, billionaires. We have some of the most mining companies situated right here in Vancouver because they call it the Wild West of B.C., the laws are still very old. And so what, what addiction do you see that they're doing for money? And you look at what mining and you look at what oil companies are doing. They're even getting subsidized. And, and, and you see that their addiction, they're killing people. They're killing the land. But I saw my dad give, you know, and, and I, and I want to raise my hands up to the elders here who kept it alive, who kept that alive. You know, I want, to raise the, I want to raise the ones who are, who are filling up these seats where you don't see a physical body, our ancestors and our people. And our, our ancestors who kept this alive, we're still here. We're still fighting, and now we have young children like this sitting around the drum. Young children right here who hold the feather to see the truth and reality of the world to move forward, to always give when you're at a longhouse, to give what you have. That's our economic system, a system of working that I believe my father upholds, my grandmother upholds, that all of his teachers and brothers and sisters and all his family that are here right now to support. And so um, I want to start with a, an opening, right? And uh, my name is Cedar George Parker. I'm from the Tisleotip Nation, Tulalip Tribes. I'm Apache, Yaki, Skaluth Tista, Tisleotip, Skaluth Tista, Tisleotip, Haichka, Sian, Spibidat. I want to introduce you to the land here shared by the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I want to open our arms to you guys if you abide by our laws, right? Abide by our laws. And um, I, I remember hearing one of the biggest gifts is being good with the children. And if you've seen my dad with the children, he, he makes them laugh. <laughs> he make, it makes them laugh, makes them happy. And, and that's what it's about in our ceremonies. The children are running around. Our children run around and they're happy because this is theirs. We're just borrowing it from them. This, you know, this world is theirs. We're just borrowing it from them. And I remember, you know, the, the, my dad's teachers, you know, you know, and Uncle Phil is here too, and um, I want to raise my hand up to you, and, you know, talking about what it is to stand up for the next generation. You know, what it is. And so if there's something, if you get impacted here, I encourage you to take that with you and share that with somebody. Share that good feeling. Share that good feeling, implement that into the world around us, implement that into our children, implement that into the education system. Education should be from the heart, and that's what I got, that's what, that's what we can see. He, you know, we give, and he gives, and he gives, and he gives, and, and it's cool because a lot of people in here do that too, and it's very beautiful. <clears throat> and so yeah, I wanna welcome everybody here to the territory and to the land. 
I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their life to come here. What a beautiful day to come together. What a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. And so um, I just want to call up our Tesleo to the singers. We're going to sing a song. So um, yeah, yeah, let's, it says, that's what it says. <laughs> Squile to know up hotly a queen Krishamin, Kai Queen Sna, to Natching Claws a Hleywip, to Natching Claws Slaywit to Fasnudge. Skaloos, Tanman, Sutil Tashan Chishet. A Yo one hot sun squallowing, Yo one hot sun squallowing. Teats, teats. Big heart. I just did my formal introduction in my language. Um, my traditional name is Halia. My name is Kaya George from Slaywitu. And Tlaylup, uh, Skalus is my father, Sitsayatsa is my mother, and in my language, we say an hot sun squalowin, but I said yuan hot sun squalowin, which roughly translates to my heart is extremely lifted today. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Thank 
pretty high up there, loosely translated to that. <laughs> um, there's no direct translation for a description of that feeling that we have in our language, but heart is full, heart is lifted, heart is, heart is uplifted by you all. And um, I wanted to, to start with that introduction as I was taught by my, by my grandparents, by my uncles and aunties, and, and that was passed down to, from my ancestors. So that was important to me to say before I spoke any further. Um, I want to start by introdu introducing and welcoming up Bob Baker, Sapluk, Kwisnas, Sapluk, and um, he will be sharing with us tonight. And I want to lift my hands and thank you for coming here, Sapluk. So, hi, Chika. I would like to welcome you up now. OCM, Jokamahat, Tan Kushaman, Sapluk. Stomachsna, Lanakila, Kanakasna, Bob Baker, driver's license. <laughs> At least I think it's illegal, I'm not sure. Thank you for this, this honor of um, welcoming, and uh, I'm honored because um, something wonderful is taking place, and it is a, uh, it is a journey that is going to take place with this information in book form and that it's going to cause goodness to happen some some insight some good thinking and actions will take place because of the information provided here my ancestral name is Sa'apalak I'm from Squamish Nation uh, Bob Baker is my uh, driver's license name as I said and uh, I want to thank my nephew for allowing me to do this and uh, his dad and myself were good friends back in the day, back in the hippie days. Hey. <laughs> if you can remember, you weren't there. Is that what they say? <laughs> <clears throat> so a lot of you got that jolt of uh, not remembering, I could see. <laughs> so to uh, welcome you in a traditional fashion is, is uh, my role here this evening, um, besides like the rest of you to sit and enjoy the information and the presentation so far. Um, I have a little bit of history with, with the George family and going back a little ways and uh, with the Leonard and uh, Marie or M Amy and um, my uh, brother-in-law who is uh, Russell Bruce, also part of the family. And so it goes on and on. We're all family. So I wanted to share a song with you that uh, reflects that in Chotmot. When we're together like this as a family, we are stronger. Uh, we don't get any stronger than when we're together like this. So it's, uh, it's an honor to do that. Um, I would um, go on and relate different stories about uh, this and that with you, but I'm pretty sure it's would be boring. And uh, here's the song in Chotmot. It's spoken in uh, the language and uh, it, again, it speaks about when we're together like this, anything can happen. <laughs>
Consortium, HK and Hatamakutsi, thanking you again for this uh, honor of welcoming you all here on this wonderful occasion. Um, I imagine a lot of what's going to be shared is going to be uh, eye-openers, and um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm a residential school survivor myself. I did a couple of years in Kamloops and um, St. Paul School and all of that. We're on a run as uh, a few of us here have uh, shared that experience. So I'm looking forward to what's going to take place this evening. And thank you again. Welcome, Hoseam. Can we get another round of applause for those beautiful words? <laughs> Throwing you another haichka, uncle. <coughs> Haichkas. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for those words and that beautiful song, uh, Sapluk. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome up somebody who um, knew my dad since my dad was 10 years old and took him in um, as one of his own and has been a great teacher for my whole family, always there when we needed somebody um, to listen, listen to us and hear and give us counsel. Also always there for a really good laugh, always. <laughs> always knew the right words to say and um, um, love you so much, Grandpa. I want to welcome up my, my dad's papa, my grandpa, Chief Phil Lane Jr. Me talk yepi. My very beloved relatives of our human family. I want to thank East Side Dakota Drum, Dakota Darcy Demas for giving those good songs. And for the sailors singers who sang. I want to say that me Doc Yepi and I say this with the utmost thanksgiving. We're here to celebrate more than just a book. We're here to celebrate the fulfillment of sacred prophecies. Sacred prophecies are being fulfilled here. As prophesied more than five hundred years ago by our Inca relatives and other sacred visionaries across the Americas. It was foretold that a great spiritual wintertime was going to come upon the indigenous people across the Americas, who, at, by the way, at that time numbered. When I was in the university, we figured about 100 million. Today, academics are figuring 108 million indigenous people lived across the Americas. Can you imagine? In relative peace and harmony, I'm not saying there was not conflicts, but compared to the rest of the world, we were living in the most spiritually developed civilization upon Mother Earth at that time. That's a fact. And that's why when this Holocaust began, this genocide, particularly illness began, by the early 1800s, out of that 100 million, there was only 15 to 20 million indigenous people left across the Americas. And here in British Columbia, by the way, only 15% of the population of the indigenous people of British Columbia were still alive at the bottom of this hole that happened. And yet at the same time, our prophecies promised without question we would arrive we would arrive. That's why this is so important. Here we had Duncan Campbell Scott, architect of Canadian Indian policies, for over almost 30 years, stated in 1920, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Our objective is to continue until there's not one single Indian left in Canada that has not been absorbed in the body politic, and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. 
to accomplish this goal, the Canadian government established 80 residential schools across Canada, where more than 150,000 children were put through the most abusive treatment you can imagine. And I got a chance to work with many of those across the country. The things that happened, you cannot even imagine that human beings, especially those who call themselves Christians, that's why I can't call it Christianity, I call it churchianity. No Christian would do such a thing to children, ever. Now, I'm not saying this to try to make anybody feel bad here. I'm saying this is what the miracle of tonight is. Now, despite the fact that never in history by international law was this land ever ceded, ever, was never yeah. ceded, unceded, this land still belongs to the indigenous people of these lands. Still does to this day. Still does. Despite the fact there has never been a treaty made, except for about 6% of this province, they established 18 residential schools here in British Columbia. 18. 18. And as I said, 85% of the indigenous people in British Columbia were wiped out. Despite this, in the greatest disaster ever hit Vancouver, 1886, all of Vancouver was burned up for except a couple of, a couple of buildings. Do you know who arrived first from across the other side of the, of the Burrard Inlet to help the people, to save the people? The indigenous people of the Salish Nation. They arrived. They came. They saved many people and brought them to North Side and became relatives, friends with them. Friends with them. And you know what the result was? They reduced the land. I'm saying this for a reason. Because by every odd, by every bet mathematically, there should be no more indigenous people here on these lands. But that's not the situation. And finally, the city of Vancouver finally recognized those relatives who came across, despite how they were being treated. Just think about that. Their care was, and still today is, the people. Life is what it's about. Well, despite this genocide, on July 24th, 1899, a young boy was born whose words, action, and family were to have and continue to have a growing impact across Canada beyond, not just with indigenous people, but with our entire human family. That is Chief Dan George, hereditary Chief Dan George. And I got a chance to meet him when he was down in Seattle. We had the first American Indian Film Festival there. And I, met, I, can't rem I always remember this so clearly, 1978. So humble. He's just so quiet. He was just sitting there so quietly. And yet when he came to speak, Tears would roll down your eyes. Tears would roll down your eyes. I got a chance to meet him before he passed on September 20, 23, 1981. That led me to a great blessing of meeting a great, great chief of this land, Chief Leonard George. And we made a film together, The Honor of All the Story of Alkali Lake. We always would come and remain spiritual brothers until he passed away December 6, 2017. When he became chief of Tsleil-Waututh, I used to stop by and visit him. And I got to tell you, Tsleil-Waututh, when I first went to visit him today, are two different places. Again, not just what Reuben's done, my son Reuben's done, but what the Tsleil-Waututh nation and all other nations are doing. This is just an example of the prophecies being fulfilled. And we made a film that shared honor of all the story of Alkali Lake. Well, I used to go visit Leonard. He, he, Leonard was always open. I see this the same as, as Reuben. He was open to all human beings. He went over to Saskatchewan to study. He brought a sweat lodge back here where there was no sweat lodges. I remember it was so clear. There was just kind of rows of houses up there at Slaywatooth. No trees hardly. hardly. I don't think there was hardly a building for administration. I think he only had about two people working for the whole nation. And we used to sit there in this little tiny sweat lodge <laughs> just for two people. That's it. That's all came. 
But this little group of boys would come, nine, ten years old. So it's called Reuben was one. Justin was another one. They'd all be coming peeking around because we were trying to get them in there. <laughs> Eventually did, didn't we? <laughs> but their dream, their dream, and I was going to pause here. I won't go on too long here. Their dream was we're going to not just grow spiritually, because I've always understood one thing about Leonard, about the George family, about the Slave Tooth Nation, about indigenous people. We know the foundation of all is the spirit, the spiritual foundation. That's what it's about. But from that, in Indian River, there's only 6,000 salmon. That's it. Put it in the hands of the Slave Tooth. Last year, there was 1.2 million salmon at one time in that stream. All these need to be returned to our indigenous people. We need to take back the parks. We need to take these things back and put them in the right hands. They brought elk back, which brought grizzlies back. And before you know it, a whole ecosystem was reborn. They have the largest solar farm in the lower mainland. They have their own school. And I could go on and on. They had, for the first time, because this, this inlet here is one of the dirtiest inlets you'll find around, they've been cleaning it. And they had their first harvest of clams. First harvest of clams after 45 years. So I want to say, let's also thank the Great Salish Nation and the Slave with Tooth Nation and the Squamish Nation, Musqueam Nation, all these nations who are rising up at this time. As a young boy, this is again a key to this. It's one thing. You can be happy and joyful at a time of happiness, good health, all these things. But it's a sign of nobility where you can stand and be strong at a time of great challenges. As a child, Reuben went for, through every form of, of interracial trauma, lateral violence, loss of his father and stepfather, sexual abuse, extended family violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, racism, suicide attempts, to name just a few. Now, I'm not just saying that to put anybody down because so many of our relatives have gone through this, but they're raising up above it because we don't have to live like that anymore. That's why we've had enough. This is right here. It stops here. And I know that message will be spread a lot of places. Full of rage and shame, Chief Reuben gifted physically would fight at a drop of a hat. Said he disrespected women. He hated himself. Every bar he walked in, he was ready to fight. Especially if anybody demonstrated disrespect to indigenous people. And I can tell you, at his age, I wouldn't want to run into him at a bar. <laughs> Maybe you would. <clears throat> and the thing I think about Reuben, no one really wanted to fight with Chief Reuben because he'd never stop. You know, so you, you mean, when you get somebody that, you, that's, you don't want to stay away from that. But he said it, it was the depths of this. He said his last fight was a tough one. He was stabbed in the leg, his shoulder was separated, he was hit in the head with a crowbar. When he came to, he said he was covered with blood, his shirt was almost ripped off, and he'd lost his wallet. <laughs> After he convinced a bus driver for a free ride home, he looked into the bus mirror and himself and the mess he was in, and he realized, unlike his beloved grandfather, that's why it's so important that all of us who are elders need to be able to stand and a good example for those following, because it was his grandfather he looked to. He, had done, he said, I'd done nothing to serve the people. And up to this moment, his life, has meant, he said, meant nothing. That's when he began his journey to sobriety. It took him two years of going to a sweat lodge, three alcohol treatment centers, and he's still, as he says, working through layers of intergenerational trauma, lateral violence, racism, colonialism, to resolve and heal. He went to Round Lake. Lee Brown, good brother Lee Brown, introduced him to the Sundance. And sure enough, just like his uncle went off to Saskatchewan, 
Here he came down to South Dakota to the most tough Sundance we have. It is tough. I mean tough. Sundance, there's 16 years with Crow Dog. And even though Crow Dog gave him permission to be Sundance chief, he waited for years because he respected it so much. And this year, he's completed his eighth Sundance. This summer, eight, eight. And he, and Crow Dog told him, do it your own cultural way. You're a Coast Salish. Do it your own cultural way. And that's what he's done. He's always followed his cultural way and also respected others. A few more things. I'm going a little bit over my time here. <clears throat> and I think right here before us in his two beautiful children, Kaya, Cedar, right here is the greatest testimony you can make of, of brother, our brother, son, uncle, nephew, however you want to call him, Reuben. It's right here, right here. And I want to also honor your mother. I also honor the two of you the way that you always have gotten together for the sake of your children. It's a beautiful thing of how you have your, both your mom and dad have done that. I could go on and on here. <laughs> I'm just going to go to this one, this one last part. Chief Reuben was, Reuben was born into a world of abuse, violence, intergenerational trauma lateral violence and racism that could have broken his heart and spirit many times, many, many times. But he always does his best to demonstrate that the light, strength, wisdom, justice, and vision found in our indigenous cultural and spiritual teaching prophecies have the dynamic capacity to resolve and bring into harmony whatever challenge we may have. So I'm going to close with this, this prophecy, this prophecy we're seeing fulfilled tonight. This prophecy was given in 1967. I was here at that time. In fact, I was here at a wrestling tournament, U.S.-Canadian wrestling tournament, in 1967. Lament for Canada. This is one part. Oh God, like the thunderbird of old, I shall rise again. I shall rise again. Out of the sea. I shall grab the instruments of the white man's success, his education, his skills, and with these tools I shall build my race into the proudest segment of your society. Before, all, before I follow the great chiefs who have gone before me, O oh Canada, I shall see these things come to pass. I shall see our young braves and our chiefs sitting in the houses of law and government, ruling and being ruled with the knowledge and freedoms of our great land. So shall we shatter the barriers of isolation. So shall the next hundred years be the greatest in the proud history of our tribes and nations. That's what tonight's about. We are rising, and I can see by all the beloved members of the human family are here that we're one. I think that's the one thing Lowe's was saying that Reuben has taught over and over again. People come, doesn't make any difference what color he, you, your outside looks. He looks here in your heart. This is where it's at. We are one human family, and we need to wake up that we're all indigenous people of this Mother Earth, and every one of us has a responsibility to ensure that this world comes back into balance, just like our beloved Son Reuben. Howly Michan Te Wash Day Alo, Shunk Manohe Meado, Chinupasapa Meado, Howly Michan Te Wash Day. In our Dakota language, before we close, we say our names, Shunk Mano and Chinupasapa, and I stand responsible before the Creator for my words and my actions. Howly Michan Te Wash Day. Aho. Aho. Papa Phil.
Doing it again. <laughs> Can I get another round of applause for my grandpa? Hi, for your words. Um, thank you for your words. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your teachings and your presence, Papa. You, you bring so much wisdom and so much power and so much inspiration. So, hi, from the bottom of my heart, I lift you up. And uh, now I'd like to uh, invite the Oceanside Dakota Drum Group to play one song before we go into Q&A. Don't worry, they'll be on again. <laughs> yeah, once you get going, it's hard to stop, huh? It's just like, whoa, you wanna, I'm gonna get up. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Haichika for that song. It's, it's been a while, huh? <laughs> the ones that know, know. <laughs> yeah, good reunion. <laughs> um, now uh, I'd like to, to announce the part that a lot of, many of us have been waiting for, I'm very, very excited for, is a conversation um, with, uh, I'll start with our moderator, Andrea Crisson, who is a member of Tsleil-Waututh Nation, award-winning radio journalist with over 30 years of experience. She's currently the executive editor of the Global Reporting Center, an independent news organization based out of UBC. 
So she's really cool, long story short. <laughs> Very smart lady. Um, and next, we uh, have two really, really incredible people. Um, Michael Simpson, a lecturer at University of St. Andrews. Michael is an award-winning author, has written extensively on settler colonialism and conflicts over oil and gas pipelines in Canada. Also helped write a really cool book that I heard was coming out today, so. <laughs> and um, last but not least, somebody uh, who raised me, <laughs> my dad. Ruben George, um, I don't think he needs too much of an introduction. <laughs> His reputation precedes him, and um, I, I just want to say thank you, Dad, and Heichka for, for putting all of these words and all the spirit into the book, and um, we look forward to hearing this conversation between the three of you. So let's give a round of applause, a big round of applause, and thank them. <laughs> and invite them up. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's truly an honor to be here tonight, and I will start with the first bit of the conversation. I just want to make it clear that I don't usually sound like this, but um, I'm a little squeaky, but I hope you'll pardon me. It was such an important night, and it was not something I was, I was going to miss, and to speak to the generosity of Ruben, he made me tea so that I would be able to do this this evening. Um, so I want to thank you both and everyone for joining us. This is such a special evening, and it's, I, I think we've already set the, set the tone of the room of the importance in the, and a room that is truly already filled with spirit. Um, so with that in mind, I want to get com start into the conversation right away um, and really sort of lead with, uh, I think that when you, when I first picked up this book, and I think for those of you who may have gotten one already this evening, um, it might be coming, you may be coming from it from the perspective that this is all about a certain period of time based around the Trans Mountain Pipeline twinning. And I want to let you know right from the get go that this is really a personal journey and a story that led up to Ruben throughout your life, the challenges you faced, as, as Chief Phil Lane pointed, had pointed out. But I want to talk about like sort of the, the multiple meetings for you of what it stops here means. Multiple meetings? Yeah, like in terms of like your personal journey in terms of what's the it. So I think because I think there's like a um, it's one thing, but it's actually many things. I don't one one thing that comes to mind is um well, thank you, thank you, Papa, thank you, Uncle. Thank you, my beloved kids, and thank you all. My, my mom, my sisters are here, and my partner, so thank you. But um, I think it is, is, when I think of it, it's, it's not just indigenous anymore. Um, when my um, two kids had a choice to go to a private school or public school, you know, we thought we'd try the private school. And they went, and Cedar didn't like it. He said, don't make me a robot. I'm not a robot. Let me be myself. And so we took him out. But Kaya thrived. And um, all the kids like her graduated at 15. And um, it was a big difference because in public schools, I saw they say, if you're really smart, if you're smart, well, you could be a doctor or a lawyer. But in the private schools, they, they said, no, you, you, could, you could run everything. You could be wealthy. And when she graduated at 15, the kids that she started school with, all of them graduated at 15, and every single one of them took political science of business. Be rich and wealthy like your parents and run things. And so that's part of it. And so we're told from when we're little in the society that we live in that, you know, this is what you do. This is what you got to live with. This is what you got to watch on TV. And in, in, in the government, you know, it's like I see more and more, even the good guys are bad. And that's what we choose between worse and worse. And, it, and it, so it is, is, is the lifestyle because one thing that I, that I see and I choose and I feel is like, like my grandfather would say something pretty simple. He'd say, millions of people want to hear my voice, which is true when he was at the height of his fame. And he says, all I want is the grass to hear me again. So, so it, is, it is not as much, we know what it is, but 
The other side of it is, what's the resolve? And that, that's, to, that's to explore and be yourself. Because when, when we're born as children, we're born perfect with no prejudice, no anger, no hate, no judgment. And the fundamentals of any religious and spiritual belief, and I'm, I'm lucky enough with Papa and other people, my kids, travel the world and did ceremony with Muslims, Buddhists, Catholics, Christians. I just did a sweat with 12 priests. I'm going to do another sweat with um, a dozen rabbis. And you know, but my grandfather would say, if you're good at it, if we're following those teachings of, of, of um, humanity, of love, honor, respect, dignity, pride, compassion, understanding, truth, knowledge, and wisdom, bravery, courage, if you follow those teachings, we could still have a good moment with one another. And that's what we found traveling the world. And my kids did that on their own. They did that on their own and prayed in Peru and, and um, everywhere around the world. They travel themselves and they, and they find each other. And when they pray, you know, with those fundamentals, they, they find a way. Number one, to connect who, who, who every human being has a right to be connected to. That's the person that they were before they are tainted by this dysfunctional society we live in. And I, and I think that. And, and, but the resolve is, you know, let, let's pray together. Let's break those barriers of isolation and start to find our individual self and, and make ourselves a better human being. And when I say that, and even in ceremony, all my family right here, right here, all of them, when we do that, you know, at, at the end of the day, at the end of the ceremony, why not? Why not love my bro more or my cousin more or my kids more? or my partner more, or my mom more, my sisters more. Why not? Because that's what it comes down to. And then when you feel that love, and I talk about this in the healing, when you feel that healing, like in ceremony, Cedar said it a little bit. He said, he said you have a responsibility when spirit touches your soul with that, those fundamentals of humanity, and that responsibility is to share it. So when I say, why not love more? Love your... Love everybody more, but then do something about it. Really do something about it. See? Me and you. Me and Eugene. <laughs> but that's what I mean. Like, and that's why we do what we do. And th this is just the beginning chapter. Like, and looking at my kids and my family and everybody. And, and you know, in and, and ways, my whole family here, all of them could speak. My sister, my brothers, nephews and nieces, all of them. But they put me and my kids in that position. They said, you know, you do it. You're doing good. And, and, and we're growing together from a, a community that was, you know, growing up, 98% of the people drink that are over 15. We had, we had what was it, um, 20, less than 20% of people working. And, and now Tsleil-Waututh got to the point where we had zero unemployment. You know, anyone who wants education and a job, they're going to get it. We put money towards healing. We put money towards environment, like you hear my papa say. We put money towards our language. My, my, my daughter took a year off school to learn our language. And so those things that matter, that feed your spirit, and that's what we're figuring out. That's what papa was saying. We're rising up because we're figuring it out. And, and we're finding our place where we should be and how it should be. And being our own individual self and celebrating. Everybody's welcome in my ceremony. You know, everybody, doesn't matter gender or, or LGBTQ, everything, every race, they're all welcome. And it should be like that. Because when at the end of the day, when spirit touches you, all those other things that this dysfunctional society teaches us aren't part of who we are. Because in ceremony, I talked about those fundamentals, love, honor, and respect, and all those good things. What we like to say is we penetrate their soul with those good teachings. And then we let their spirit expand. And when their spirit expands, it pushes all that craziness out. So. And when we talk about this, the, like your journey towards the, the, to ceremony and to sweat lodge, I think that it's one thing that's really powerful that I found in the book is also just how you open you are about your own personal experience and also tied into that very clearly and, and in very um, strong terms, the role 
the roles of intergenerational trauma and lateral violence and colonial, colonialism, not in a historical sense, but in, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in a today sense. <laughs> I feel like there's like a whole story going on behind us too. But, but I want to talk a little bit about it because it's, it's integral to all of what we're going to talk about in this conversation and in this book is that there's a foundation of which this is built and part of it is your own journey and your own challenges. And I just want to talk a little bit about like how you felt about sharing what you went through as, as really struggling as a teenager and having, having some very, very dark days. Yeah, well, I think our story of tsleil and my family is the story of most indigenous people across Canada. We all have a family member down there in Maine and Hastings. We all do. And uh, I think, I, I, I say it like this was, it, within ceremony, you know, we, we carry, um, the society is set up to fix mental, emotional, physical trauma. But it's not set up to fix spiritual trauma. And that spiritual trauma is evident that it's, it's all over the world. It is. Because we wouldn't allow people to make the decisions that they're making to do what they're doing and creating this destruction where fires are happening everywhere and, and, and floods and all this crazy weather. And, and um, so we all are living in a world of trauma, but my trauma was, 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 was for example, it's like an open wound that may, might need stitches and a Band-Aid and antibiotics. And My grandpa, when he's filming Little Big Man, he came up on a horse with Dustin Hoffman and they looked at the, the whole village was dead. And, and, they, and they, Dustin Hoffman says, why do they do this? And he goes, because they're crazy. They killed this whole family, and they said, okay, we're, the, the actor, um, the director said, action. They rolled up, rolled up and Dustin Hoffman, why do they do this? And Grandpa started crying. He never cries. And he goes, cut, what's wrong, chief? And he goes, I've seen this before. I've seen my village like this before, born 1899. So that trauma was passed on. And in... And, 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 Modern psychology, they say three generations of trauma could be passed on, but what we believe is seven generations. And when it's passed on to my mom, to me, to my kids, it's an open wound spiritually. And what we do is close those wounds in ceremony. So it's a spiritual trauma that we have to heal. And, and, and within that, with my mom, my sister, my family, my kids, you know, I wasn't a good person. I was an awful person. I was a prisoner of all the bad things I did. It held me back from being a better human being. And, and what happened is in ceremonies, I closed those wounds. And, and, and I found freedom away from being a prisoner because I said, sorry, the best way I could. In circles or whatever I had to do, I said, sorry. Men, women, everybody, my mom, my kids said, sorry. But then also, I was a prisoner of the, the, guilt, uh, the shame of being hurt. And, and, and that was a trauma. And that carries the spirit. And I know you understand because love has a spirit. Two people could come together and a love spirit is born between them. But two people could come together and a trauma spirit is born between them. And those are the wounds that we close. And the, and, the, and, the, and the shame that I carried and the hurt that I carried from the trauma that I've been through, I closed that wound and found freedom. I found freedom. So in this book, I was a little bit worried about some of the questions that would come about like that. Like you just asked, I was worried about those questions. But it's not who I am. It's not. Not to say that somebody has a problem with me, I won't address it, I will. And the best way I know, because we have to fix those traumas between each other to move forward, to be a better human being. And, and, um, but I, I feel comfortable and happy the way things, things are. So I, it's okay to write down those things and, um, because it's not who I am anymore. I did lots of really good healing, and so did my whole family. They're all beautiful. They're all just beautiful, and Cedar goes like, it's all summer. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> but yeah, thank you. I think there's, um, and I think that's one thing also, there's a real generosity in this book because you really acknowledge a lot of the mentors, your family, supporters, community, Tsleil-Waututh Nation. This is really, it's a... Um, uh, it speaks to so many people in your life uh, who have who have been uh, who have helped you on this journey and who you've looked to, 
and so, so many of them are in the room tonight and it's a beautiful thing. I also I want to introduce and bring Michael into this conversation as somebody who as a as a partner in you in this on this journey, I want to get a little bit of a, a sense of how you two connected on this on on this uh, to, to embark on this incredible project together. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, so I, I wrote an afterword to the book that kind of talks about this a little bit, and um, I start the afterword by saying, um, I heard of Reuben George long before I met him. And um, I guess the reason for that is I was uh, a PhD student at um, University of British Columbia in the Department of Geography, and I was writing uh, my PhD dissertation on the Trans Mountain Pipeline. <clears throat> and so I was kind of like adjacent to a lot of the organizing and like participated in some of the actions that like Reuben and Tsleil-Waututh and Sacred Trust and you know all the other many nations <clears throat> were organizing against Trans Mountain. Um, and then I came to the end of my my PhD dissertation, and um, as many people will know, like a kind of typical next step in your career progression after like finishing a, in academia is to publish the dissertation as a book. But I felt kind of really uncomfortable with that because in this case. You know, the book was about this, you know, movement that was an indigenous-led movement, and I felt really like kind of, you know, unsure like what authorizes me to, to, to talk about this. What authorizes me to kind of like impose my, my voice on that on that movement? What, um, like, who am I accountable to, in this work? And like, how do I find like my voice as a writer? And so, I was kind of like grappling with that for quite a while, and then um, just like approached Ruben and you know, kind of just was seeking his advice and um, to, to speak to that generosity of uh, spirit that you that you mentioned, like Ruben said right away, he said, why don't we write a book together? Um, which, you know, just seemed like such a better way to proceed um, and also just like an incredible opportunity. So, um, so that's kind of how we first connected. But even then, you know, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I remember one of the first meetings that we had where we were like, okay, we're gonna write this book together. And I still kind of thought it was a book about the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And I kind of came prepared with, you know, all these like notes and ideas of like different chapters and stuff. And Ruben kind of listened to me for a little bit. And then, <clears throat> and then he started talking and he started telling his story. And I was just like, okay, like there's like a much bigger, more interesting, like deeper, more important, story to be told here and that's you know Ruben's story and that's the story of you know uh, the Slay with Youth people and the George family and the history of the colonization of uh, you know these lands and waters and the the Trans Mountain Pipeline is really kind of just the tip of the iceberg and I think you know that would probably be like a fairly obvious point to a lot of indigenous folks you know that this is just yet another instantiation of like ongoing colonial harm and violence against indigenous lands um, but I think for, you know, a lot of like non-Indigenous people, even people who are fighting against Trans Mountain, that might not necessarily be um, as apparent. So it, it became really kind of, you know, it became clear to me that this was Ruben's story that needed to be told. It wasn't a story that I could tell, but it was a story that I could like, you know, I guess facilitate or help Ruben to tell. And I think that's kind of how, yeah, I guess that's kind of how things started in some way. Well, not really, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, 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 what's, joke. Ruben, joke. what's your version? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not joking. I'm really joking. <clears throat> no, we became good brothers. Um, um, you know, uh, I, I, he's it's, it's in Scotland teaching at a university, and we're going to do a launch there, and and uh, we became really close, and and uh, we just didn't go sit in the office and start talking. We we started in Weywich, and, and then we went to visit Cecily. You mentioned that, and and um, we went swimming and <laughs> speared salmon. And um, I won't tell him what happened when we caught it. <laughs> but um, apparently, apparently, there was a um, a, a mortal struggle. Yeah. <laughs> <to access. laughs> but it is 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 good. Like we 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 for sure became family and brothers, and you know. I mean, one thing I would say is, um, you know. There's this moment in the book where you talk about the collaborations and the, you know, I guess the the relationships that you built with other non-indigenous folks who were fighting the pipeline, particularly like people, I guess, who were organizing through the NGOs 
and the, like the environmental groups um, who you allied with. And, you know, you talk about how, you know, yourself and some of the Coast Salish elders, like, said to people, like, if you want to work with us, you know, or... I'll show if, you why. Yeah, that, you, that was uh, Philene and Robert and Haney, my mom, and um, Shane Point. And you said, you know, you have to come sit in ceremony with us to mm -hmm. see why we do the work we do. And I think, you know, you never necessarily specifically said that to me, but I kind of think in a way you were kind of, you know, it was, it was very similar, right? Like you, as you said, we were doing all these things. This was a book that was... Um, it was more organic because you just, I said, come. Yeah, we were just always out, to, like every time we met to work on the book, I never really knew what my day, what would unfold, you know? <laughs> and I'd say to my partner, okay, I'm going to work on the book, and she'd be like, when are you going to be home? And I'd just be like, I have no idea. <laughs> and Ruben would just be like taking me off to different parts oh, of... Okay. <laughs> I would like to take this moment to thank our dog, Sky. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. think that's... Yeah, and we went everywhere, spent time with Nathan right here, right. And yeah. with my sister and everybody. But I think that was important, like you were like showing me what you were telling me about. Yes. You know, and there was a lot of lessons that I like personally learned from, you know, you, were, you taught me a lot, Ruben, and I just want to also take a moment to, to thank you, you know, for bringing me on this journey and just for, yeah, all the, the, the teachings and to thank you the George family and for all of your generosity and for entrusting me and just kind of welcoming me into this process. So, yeah. And the intergenerational healing turned into yours too, right? Yeah. So he, it, it worked out really good that way. As we talk about sort of the, um, the importance of the Tsleil-Waututh tooth in this conversation and what you learned in your experience in spending time, I think that um, for those who are not Tsleil-Waututh in the room, uh, understanding the story of the history, the people, the land, the territory, um, is also tied to very much the struggle and the fight regarding Trans Mountain Pipeline, and talking about what it means to be people of the inlet. And I think there's a really uh, important message in this book that you really uh, make clear of the love of the land, the water, the importance of it. And just maybe if you can elaborate a little bit on that. I think I could say it easy, remember? I told you after we had that talk, and then I went home and my kids, and I always talk to them. Like, even when we started the fight, they were young. They were like, it was uh, almost 13 years ago, and you're like, they're just, Kai was 12, Cedar's 14. Around there, 11 and 13. And um, when I talked to them, I said, it's going to be busy. It's going to be hard. And they said, no, do it, Daddy. He said, let's do it. We could do it. And they've been with me the whole time, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so like, like, like the book, I, I, I talked to them, and I, I said, hey, we might do a book and I don't know, like, I don't know what it would be about. And Cedar <laughs> is, is like, it's easy, Dad. It's, it's like Star Wars. <laughs> and I went, what? And you're, you're probably going, what? And, and he goes, it's the evil empire Canada against the rebels Georges. No, yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, we had the force, <laughs> the great spirit. <laughs> So um, that's what it was because, you know, I, I think of my mom and Papa Phil and my uncle Bob and, you know, um, what, despite what they've been through, and, and, and I talk about this in the chapter a lot about my mom and all those things you've been through in residential school, no, no, no nice way to say it, that the, the abuse that happened there, physical, mental, emotional, sexual abuse and witness of murders. I talk about that in the book too. And, and we interviewed my mom. And despite that, and I talk about this, you come to ceremony, my mom's gonna say, call me Ta'a. If you're brand new, and no matter nationality you are, and a lot of you are here, some of you, and, and, and you remember that, she says, call me Ta'a. No matter nationality or where are you from or whatever, and that means grandma. I, 
So it's good. It's good. And, and despite, and that turns into something else, you know, without fight. And, and, and I seen my grandpa do it, my mom, my parents, everybody had to do something. And, and Cedar says this, and Kaya, Cedar came up with it. He goes, I will not be the generation that stops fighting for what we love. So. I think the power of, I, I, as we sit here, and uh, so my grandmother and your grandfather attended residential school together. They attended St. Paul's together. And I was reflecting on it earlier and thinking what a powerful thing it, it is and the power of our ancestors to be here today, just two generations later, to be able to have these conversations and see the power of what you've, what you've put into, uh, what, you, what you've thought through and what you've put into words in this book is just an incredibly important part of this next chapter. So I thank you for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, as we sort of alluded to earlier, the conversations around the trans flight pipeline and the fight for that. And at one point in the book you refer to, it sort of leads you into talking about reconciliation and specifically you referring to reconciliation is dead. And I think that this is a really important point because it sounds on, to say that statement, you can start with it as being, this is a negative, but I actually think you take it to a really interesting place around what if it's not reconciliation, what it is and what's the importance and the value of what we bring to this that we may not be in a place of it's it's all about the government and this colonial system and what it means to step away from that so i'd love for you to talk about that i think it's a really important point you make well i think slaywatooth we were pretty well the first nation in canada to meet with trudeau and his cabinet when he first got in and um it wasn't because he wanted to it's because he had to, and 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 because Slavic is doing okay. I know there's nations that aren't, and we see that, and we work with them. They might not have the resources, or might still be stuck in some something, and 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 they're still getting screwed over. They are, and and so you have to recognize a problem to have any sort of reconciliation. So what happened is um like. They said, yeah, your economic analysis is right. Canada's is wrong. Yeah, you're right. You're going to kill the orca whales. But we're going to side with the best interest of Canada. And now, now look at it. What is the, the tolling fees are any other pipeline, they're $11 per barrel, 2 million barrels going through a day. And, 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 and for this pipeline, it's going to be $23 a day. They're going to subsidize that. Two mil, I'm, I'm sorry, almost a million barrels a day they're going to subsidize, and it comes out to $16 billion. So our analysis is right, and we said that all along. But despite that, they, they, they push this through. And, you know, and, and for what? Like, we, we work with the people of Alberta Tarsons. They're dying. They're dying. Eugene and is up there, and so my chief and counsel, I think Charlene, were in New York talking to um, Wall Street and, and New York Pension Fund. They ended up taking their money out of there, I think 350 million. And they and, and Eugene called me and his like, do, do you wanna do you wanna go sp talk to Richard Kinder and Kinder Morgan? I said, Yeah. I said, damn right. And they said, Well, okay, you got an hour to pack and order in your your flight right now. And we went down and we dealt with all that stuff. And and but it, all along, it's always been bad and wrong and we told them that people were dying we told them that they're dying there and and, and they have the highest concentration rate of cancer there and everything's going to die and and so we we kept on pushing and pushing and 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 and, and the reconciliation didn't exist through this whole process the neb we you know stephen kelly put in in the very beginning put in 20 percent of Kinder Morgan's application to the National Energy Board on behalf of the National Energy Board, then they hired him. And then they created a reconciliation, or there was a, the, um, a, a subcommittee to deal with that. And, you know, we said you can't unscramble an egg. And, um, yeah. <laughs> that was Deadpool, Redpool. 
I didn't even know that existed, and I saw it on a um, commercial drive on a post. <laughs> Get rid of that one. That's Mother's Day. <laughs> but, you know, and, and so even when we went to court there, we, we submitted our submissions to the Federal Court of Appeal. We gave them um, Canada our submissions, and they took ours. Then we saw all these notes on our submissions that they gave back to us. And then, and then when they gave it back to us, we saw that their submissions were changed to those notes. So we went to the judges and said, hey, look, they agree with us, it's wrong. They said, oh, we're not gonna look at that. So from the beginning of Stephen Kelly dealing with Kinder Morgan, it was all screwed up. And it continues to be screwed up. And the thing is, we're standing there and fighting it, but you're all getting screwed too. We are, and it goes back to what we, what we think we have to settle with. In actuality, we don't. We're a small little nation that came from 13 people. My mom was 42 of the 13 people. I'm, I'm 88, 188 of the 13 people. And we're now we're at 600, but we're making a difference. And we're choosing to make a difference. And I think anybody can make a difference. Then it goes, goes back again to, reconciliation ourselves like with our spirit <laughs> that's a good start reconciliation with our own spirit as a human being and recognizing we have a spirit and we could do something with it like i said we could love more and heal more and but also we could use it to create a better world and that's what i think my family does Heichka. I think part of what you also offer is it's, I don't, I, I think it's overstating it to refer to it kind of as a call to action. I think of it as more of an invitation that you offer for those who are not indigenous, who are white settlers who feel that they want to connect and understand when we talk about spirit, when we talk about the importance of the land, the territory, the, the, the culture, the language. And so, I, I, what, what's that invitation look like to you? I feel like to some extent it was an invitation extended to Michael in his experience as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable in certain ways to like kind of talk about how this process was, was really healing uh, for me. And I guess that's partly because you know, it, it, I think there's a bit of a danger, kind of slippery slope when we talk about how, you know, like white settler folks like myself, you know, are, have to do healing work. And that, and I guess the danger is kind of both kind of recentering the experience of like the kind of the white settler, um, but also like kind of the drawing of false equivalencies between the experiences of, you know, indigenous folks and, and settler folks, but you know, um, that being said, like you say some really amazing things in this book, Ruben, like you talk about how <clears throat> European people colonized themselves. It took, I think you say something like European people, it took them thousands of years to colonize themselves before they started colonizing other parts of the world. And so there's a, you know, a sense in which I, I think you're kind of saying like the colonial harm even impacts people who are the beneficiaries of like, you know, contemporary, uh, settler colonialism and you talk about a friend of yours who, who came, you know, who I, th I think was like a, a, a white person who came to you seeking help. Maybe you want to talk about that a little bit and then you, sure. you ask them, how, like, how long have you been disconnected from, from spirit, right? He, he was my fireman and he'd, he'd make the sweat fire and he said, I, I'm having a hard time to connect to spirit. And I said, how long have we disconnected from it? And he goes, how? And I said, prayer, meditation, prayer. He goes, my whole life. And I said, is that it? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, was, well, did your parents pray? He goes, no. I said, is that it? And he said, I said, did your grandparents pray? And he goes, no. So that's the sort of like, not sort of, it is, I believe, uh, intergenerational spiritual trauma of even neglecting your spirit. And what I was saying in the beginning, if we have genuine spirit and it touches you, you're going to want to make a difference. You are. And I know all my Sundancers here think the same way, but here's the other thing about it too, around the invitation. Papa used to talk all the time, 
And he said to me, he said, if I'm not teaching you to surpass me, I'm failing. And we do the same thing. My kids do. Like, my son is like, Dad, you know a lot of really good things to apply to yourself? And I'm like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they keep me accountable, like my partner, my kids. And, 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 and in some ways, Curtis, you know, when he runs ceremony now, is he elevated himself in, in, a, in a way that he teaches me now. And they teach me, and everybody does. And so when we're inviting people, it's, 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 not, it's, it's a way of life that's genuine. Because we see in all ceremonies, even, even in indigenous ceremonies, even ones I used to run were wacky. I should not have been running ceremony when I was so young. But now I think I, because everybody makes me accountable, I do okay. And, and, but we, we, what we need to seek is no matter what it is, is, um, is something genuine. Because we see so much up there that's not. I don't think Trump follows those teachings. You know? I, don't, I don't think the nuns and priests follow those teachings when they're, they're not at all. When they're doing all those horrible things in residential school. They're doing quite the opposite. But if you look at those teachings, no matter what it is, they're good. Because Grandpa said that. If you're Catholic, Christian, Muslim, doesn't matter what you are. If you're, if you're doing it, just be good at it. And if you're good at it, we can pray with one another. So that invitation is actually to find that freedom. Find that freedom that I found. Because our whole world is in trauma. And we're doing nothing about it. Our whole world is, in, and we're stuck and programmed to think from, like I said, in elementary school and throughout our whole life of how we should be and how we should act and what we could stand for. But the truth is, a lot of individuals did a lot of really good work and made a big difference and stopped that damn pipeline. It's supposed to be built, in, what, eight years ago and it's and still not built. And now they got more challenges because nobody wants to put their oil through it because it's so expensive. They, 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 you know, elections coming up, they got a big problem. And that's us again. That's us. Yeah. yeah. I was pointing at Eugene Kung. He, he did a lot of the, um, him, he worked with a lot of economists in the States and Canada, even in Europe we talked to, and, and um, he, he, he works for West Coast Environmental Law, works for Tsleil-Waututh, and, and he, he feeds me all this information, and there's also Chloe and Aaron, Charlene, Gabe, and um, all this stuff. They make me sound really smart because they, <laughs> they keep teaching me. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Eugene, and... But that's what it is, I believe. I, we talked a little bit about some of the things that I've, I've drawn from reading this book, but I want to make sure that I get a chance to ask you what, you, what do you hope for others who pick this up, whether Indigenous or non-Indigenous, what they can, what, what, you, what you hope is that when they get to the conclusion of it, how they feel and what they've learned? Well, it's a hard read in the beginning, first couple of chapters. And... Um, but when you, if, when you get through it, I, I, don't, I don't want them to think, oh, poor Indian, poor First Nation, we'll go through all that. No, it's like there's trauma across the board, I think. Because, I, like I said, going back, we wouldn't make the decisions that we're making or allow those things to happen. Because, um, like I said, tr trauma could be spiritual. And I think our world's in spiritual trauma because it, we, we wouldn't allow that when, when spirit touches you. And, and we think that. And I talk about in the sweat lodge. I, my grandpa would say, pray so the words will fall down to the hearts of the people that are listening. But that word has a spirit. That's what we believe. And if that spirit falls in your heart, you know, what we hope will do is it, it expand. You got some trauma on your head and your mind or something. But when you expand, what happens, you push it out. You push it out of a sweat lodge and you open the door and the steam goes out and that's all your trauma. But when that happens, you know, it heals and you want to make better choices. So Everybody, the world needs a sweat lodge. <laughs> so, so, so with that, maybe I, I hope, uh, hope, hope for individuals. And in, you know, uh, the film that we showed in the beginning was, was um, you see the filmmakers, they're here. Where's Gary? Oh, it's right out there. <laughs> he made. He, we're making that film. And it's sort of weird because I, I took pride and I still do in my sobriety. You know, I was 25 when I quit and I'm, 20, I'm, I'm 53 now. And so I'm 28 years sober. But what we did is we, we went to ceremonies and 
and we worked with Gabor Mate and a bunch of psychologists and therapists and 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 because my people kept on falling off at him men's treatment center I was volunteering at and I was like we need something we need something to help and and then what it was is psychedelics we did see an ayahuasca and what it did for people and and we're like okay let's look at that so four of us that were consulting other companies and business we got together and said let's go listen to them and then and then they we started seeing the reading about the healing that happened they kept on saying you got to try it it's uh, and I'm, papa you're doing the same thing at the same time this is how we're connected at the same time not knowing we're doing the same thing and then and then after six months of them asking us to do it, he finally said, you know what, we can't tell somebody what to do unless we're willing to do it ourselves. So I tried it. And that's where I closed those, those intergenerational wounds. That's where I, cl I closed them. So since then, I think Papa combined together in our both organizations, about 80 residential school elders. Um, your group, I think, did more. You're probably up over 250. Our group with Gary, who's doing the filming, and Brian right here, and, and my partner, we did probably about 140, so two, two, 220 all together in the last two years. And, and we changed everything. It changed everything, but what it was creating and what, what I'm saying, and this is how we work in ceremony. All my family right here, all you guys, we work with people as individuals to create them to be better. And we're a big family. And my Sundance, I think 350 people. And... Um, and, and we work with each other as individuals to help us to, all to heal. And, and, and then we made a community. And my whole community, then, they're, all, they're all environmentalists and healers. And even if they're doing business stuff, they still come and help with everything else. And, 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 and that, that created a community. So that's what we want people to get out of the book is like, let's, let's, let's heal as an individual because we'll, as a, and then create a community then, because that sweat, when I came to Canada, it was just a couple of us. A couple of me, my mom, and other, a couple others when I moved back from the States. And now there's like 900, I think, of our family members identified. And it keeps growing and growing and growing. And, and, and that, that's what we want, people to heal so we can make better choices. With that, I'd like you to... Um, uh, I think it would be a really powerful moment to be able to have a reading. And I'm going to ask you to read your selection, actually, from the, uh, the last chapter of the book, um, which is highlighted on page 240, uh, because I think it's a, it's a beautiful summary of how, of your journey, the journey of the Slave with Tooth people, and actually what you look to going forward. So the, the last chapter, we will take you with us. <clears throat> we will take you with us. We'll take anybody with us who wants to learn a better way. It's clear that we, what we need globally is more love and spirit, connection to our individual spirit, to our ancestral spirit, to whatever you believe your God or creator to be, which in turn connects us to the spirit of all things that are good. The world is losing its connection to the land, the water, the air, the energy of the sun, all those things that we need to live and that are rooted, all those things that we need to live and that, that's rooted in trauma. People don't love the earth or others enough to stop harm from making a better way itself in the sign of trauma. As to slay with the people, we're healing from our trauma. We're healing our hurt, our pain, and we will do this with you. We will open our doors to you. We will help you recognize the trauma that you also carry. What prevents you from caring about the harm that is being done to you, to other human beings and living creatures, and to the earth. When you come to my ceremonial lodge, our spirits will expand to the size of the space and overlap with one another in prayer. When that happens, we come, become brothers, sisters, and family in ceremony. That's where the healing takes place. So we will take you with us, and we will heal together.
think this seems like a, a really good moment to open up this conversation. You've all been so patient and kind and generous with your time and as we have worked through uh, a lot of what we have, what covered a lot of what we wanted to cover around the book, but uh, this is an important uh, conversation for everybody and it's one that we, we want to invite you to. So with that in mind, we've got a short period of time to ask you for questions. There's gonna be two people who are gonna be on each aisle who are gonna be available to help you with that. Chloe on this side and Jason is gonna be joining on that side. So if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to indicate to Chloe or to Jason. I will ask you that um, we, there, are, uh, there are so many uh, people in this audience and I would appreciate it if uh, knowing that, that we want to get as many points of view in as possible and so as many questions as possible, I'll ask if you could keep your questions short and to the point as best as you can so that we can um, appreciate uh, everyone's uh, questions and perspectives. So with that, I'll ask, I have on the left-hand side, Jason. Um, hi, my name's Omri. Uh, thank you so much and obviously thank you so much for the work that you do and it was really uh, yeah, enlightening to hear some of these words spoken tonight. I just bring word from the Watch House elder, Jim Layden, who unfortunately can't make it here due to housing issues, but he sends his best. Um, I also just wanted to say um, Gold Corp, whose building this is in, um, really we can't give them any credit in all of this because, of course, they're doing extractivism in other places in the world, and we need to make sure that extractivism doesn't happen anywhere in the world, so I just wanted to say that. And then finally, I wanted to say that the Mountain Protectors, which is a group that I do work with, um, which has elders in it, including Jim Layden, and others who are helping to defend the land up against the Trans Mountain Pipeline, and the Terminus Point in so-called Burnaby, um, is going to be doing an onboarding on September 28th. For anyone here in the audience who is interested in helping out with some of that work, uh, there's all sorts of spaces. Of course, I'm not the best person to be speaking to that, but I was given the opportunity. And so here, here it is um, on September 28th. If you're interested in being an on, on boarded uh, to that work uh, through uh, Elder Jim Layden as well as others uh, to help out in this monumental effort that we've heard so much about and that folks here have contributed so much to and to do your part in it, um, please come and find me after, um, or other folks who are involved in the Mountain Protectors. Thanks. What's your question? <laughs> that was a shameless plug for an <laughs> environmental plug. <laughs> I know that very well. <laughs> I hope you I will approve too. of that. <laughs> Just give them a minute and they go five. <laughs> I know that too. <laughs> With that in mind, maybe let's, uh, if there's a reflection that you have, we have so little time. This is a, a precious time that we have with Ruben and with Michael. So let's make, I hope to make the most of it. Hi there. Um, if you could uh, share your most significant spiritual experience that brought you to this place. This is my first sweat. Oh. <laughs> It's my first sweat. Um, I was, it's in the book. I talk about it. I was, I was dating a girl, and, and she came in to hug me, and I, and I was like 19, and I put my hands up. No, this is later. I was 22. And I put my hands up, and she goes, why, why do you block me from hugging you? I said, no, I don't. And she went, hug me, and I went like that again. She goes, see? She goes, you need help, and you need healing. And I, and I started going to... Um, a psychologist and once a week for a couple of years and I still couldn't be affectionate I still couldn't hug or hold any even when I slept beside her I'd pull my arm out and put a pillow there and then I'd go to sleep because I couldn't handle touch even a birthday hug I didn't like I was so rough around the edges so I went to a sweat and they and, and I, they said it's your turn to pray and I said what do I do I said, you introduce yourself to the ancestors. You say, hello, my name is Reuben. I'm, I'm your, I come to pray to you. I said, I could do that. I said, do it. And I did that. And then and I said, now what? And he goes, pray. And I said, for what? For good things in your life. And I went, okay, I could do that too. 
And I said, I, and then I opened my mouth and I cried because when my grandpa died in two, I was 11 years old, I said, I'm not going to cry anymore. So that was, I was 23. And I opened my mouth and I just cried. I cried and I cried and I cried. And I, I started climbing out and the sweat was over and I'm crawling out on my hands and knees and I looked up and these, these two guys had their arms open and, and I hugged them. And it was like the first time hugging somebody in my life felt like, and I just filled them in. And since then, 30 years now, I've been going to sweat every week. <laughs> or a long house or whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, hug, I hug everybody. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. I always wonder, why are you so tall? Did you, what did you eat in your life? <laughs> but coming to a serious question, what, uh, because I was told that the difference between settlers and immigrants is settlers have guns and immigrants have food. So what is your experience with immigrants from Africa and Asia and how do you think uh, the, we can work together because I'm from Africa but my parents are from Asia. Thank you. I, th I think my experience is um, I, 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 see, I was from Guatemala um, we were praying together and but this is how we met. She goes the stars are the reflection of heaven. She said I see those stars in your eyes like you see them in my eyes because in ceremony we both experienced heaven. And that's why we love each other, grandson. And I said, yeah, that's right. And, but I think when people come and they're, and they're still spiritually intact, we, 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 we resonate with each other and, and, and we pray with each other. And You know, when Red Cloud was pretty famous, indigenous, and this is like in the early 90s, and he came to my brother Sweat, and, and he was like, uncle, you poor. And he goes, no, 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 no. When I come to your house, I pray your way. When you come to my house, I pray my way. And that's what I do. I, I, I like to pray. And, you know, and, and all the ceremonies I've seen and been part of around the world, they use all the same things we do, fire, earth, water, and sky. And they, and they, and they use it all in their ceremonies. So I could see and know what's going on. And then, but the teachings are the same. And, and when they're good and genuine about it, I, I don't have a problem connecting with them. And so when people come here, you know, and Vancouver is a big city, two million people, and this might feel lost a little bit. But when they find us, and they go, "Wow, wow, cool," and they and we just feel that. And I think when culture is intact, um, they they could they could no matter who it is could resonate with us. I think the way I taught my mom and others is, is we don't compromise ceremony, so we don't compromise our belief. And I did that when doing family therapy that I hired like two psychologists and about 10 elders and we incorporated, no, we took any psychological model and we translated it to native legends and stories teaching them. Grandpa said, anything you heard and learn about in college university, there's native teaching that says the same thing around psychology. And then with the environmental work, we did the same thing, like again with Eugene and others, is um, um, it, when we started fighting the fight with TMX, remember this, Papa, you guys said that um, you have to teach them our way. And I was like, holy smokes, I could, how could I teach our way of spirit to people who don't even understand that they have a spirit inside of themselves? Mm -hmm. But we did that with our 1,200-page assessment, spill analysis, a, a clean analysis, multiple economic studies, all was based on Tisleewati Nation law. I love what I love what um, um, West Coast Environmental Law are taking that concept and spread it across Canada. I like how Sierra Club is doing something similar, spreading it across, and and so, you know that that was that just started just almost from nothing, but we built it up to to create something. But what I'm saying is, you don't compromise ceremony, so don't compromise your belief. Eat, no matter what you're doing in work, even in business, even in business now, and you know, um, um, Omar and I are, are doing it's green hydrogen. Eventually, it's, we're going to make energy 
out of garbage to create our hydrogen. And right now we're working with um, uh, nations that own dams. They own them and by their energy we're going to create hydrogen. And, but even in business, when we sit with somebody, we'll talk with them and I say, do you know the history of Canada and how they treated indigenous people? Whether they say yes or no, we say it anyway. We, we say, well, we weren't immune to those things that happened. And, and right then and there, and I said, the reason why we want to make money is to make sure we go where we want, when we want, work with who we want, not have money being an issue. Because what my kids seen in South America where their friends are being murdered for doing, speaking and doing what we're doing, we want to help them. When we were in Australia, remember that? When we were in Australia, they're like 60 years behind how indigenous people were treated here. They're treated horrible, the indigenous. And that's their land. But we want to help them. And that's the idea of our own business. So we, we don't compromise. So the business partners that we created, they want to help. Not just with, with, with the hydrogen, but they want to help with the healing. They want to help with the, with the, with the journeys that we're going to do. And, and, and the same with the, 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 the making this movie. They're beautiful people. We do ceremony together. And, but the, the money that we're applying for, we make sure it's going to be good money. And, and, and I mean, not good money, good people that we would work with. That's what, that's what we want. So, so once you believe in this, you know, and the other part of it is, if you believe in your goal, and that's to stop the pipe and with everything that you are, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, if you believe in it so much, eventually your spirit believes in your goal and makes your path to your goal easier. And, 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 and that's what we do, and that's what I teach you. My son, my brother, and I know you're friends with my kids, and that's what we want. We want that. Uh, first, I want to just uh, thank you for what you've done and continue to do as a leader with, uh, and leading in, an, in such an authentic way. Um, you know, there may be someone here that's, that's questioning or wondering, like, how do I uh, approach or, or attend such sacredness or ceremonies? You, you know, it's evident that culture saves lives. And from the people I've spoken with over the past year, more and more people want to learn and attend and and, and learn these ways. And I think many people uh, kind of tiptoe and wonder, well, how do I do that? I think our, our brother shared earlier about, you know, I didn't want to just write this on my own. I, I, I didn't feel like I was able to do that. Uh, so what sort of advice would you give to someone uh, who wants to approach and attend these ceremonies that are obviously saving people's lives? Well, one, one part of it I believe is, 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 is um, Spirituality is about being good people. Be a good person. Start being a good person. Mm -hmm. And if you can't find anything, just go anything of any sort of in the forest, in the woods, and meditation. You know, my whole family's doing yoga at one time because I'm um, Cedar's goddad owns a yoga studio on commercial, and, and my kids still go. And they called me a yogi, so that was my graduation, so I don't go anymore. <laughs> I need to. But I did. No matter what it is, do something. Do something to connect your, to your own self and, and meditate no matter what, but work on those fundamentals. It, and any religious or spiritual belief that you want to follow, that's okay. But those fundamentals of love and honor and respect and all those good things that I talked about, that, that has to be the, the lead in it. It has to be the lead in it. And, and, and any ceremony, including mine, if you're disrespected in any way, you can get up and leave. It's your right. You, you have to pray in a place where you're comfortable and feel good and cared for and that you're going to be in such a safe place that you have an open wound of a spiritual wound that you need to close it. That, you need it safe. You need it comfortable. You need it good. You need it beautiful. You know, some of my teachers would get hard on me. Remember, Darcy? When our teachers would get hard on us, they'd yell at us. But what they wanted, though, with urgency is us to experience their experiences. But one thing I found now is that whether I'm hard on somebody, rarely I am, but if I'm hard on somebody or soft on somebody, it doesn't matter. If I could talk to them, the people who want to get it are going to get it. That's what I hope for. And, and the other thing is, is um, just make sure you're safe. Just safe. I think that's a, a beautiful note for us to wrap up this can, part can of the conversation, please. Well, thank you. This is my cousin. This is my cousin. <laughs>
Thank you, my brother. Thank my kids. Thank you, Papa. My sister, my mom, my sister, Cecily. Stand up, please. Stand up, please. Give him a hand. You too, Sarah. Stand up, Cedar Kaya. Papa, stand up. Let's see. My niece, stand up. That's a part of my family. Think these guys are my family too. Drummers. And um my partner. Olivia, stand up. My beautiful partner. No no no. Don't sit down yet, stand up. I I just really you know, I I I I I say a lot of good things, but I'm not even a good example about how to be. I, I go for healing myself. And, I, and it's so beautiful to have somebody who stands beside me just despite I'm, I'm wacky. You know, and I love you and I thank you for being there and supporting me. And, you know, thank you very much. Love you. And thank you, Mike, my brother. And, um, the first three rows are my family, Sundancers too, and my family, so thank you guys. We do something silly. It was um, 300, the Spartans, where, where he says, Spartans, what's your profession? You jumped the gun, you're not Spartans. I said, Sundancers, what's your profession? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, so much. We so appreciate your time, your et energy, your effort, and your commitment to learning and to hopefully uh, l just get so much out of the experience of reading. This such an important book. So thank you so much. And uh, we have more to come, so please just stand up and stretch your legs if you need to. But there's, there's more to come this evening. So please thank you all so much for taking your time tonight. And it's, it's been such an important night. <laughs>
Uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming out and um, yeah, round of applause for um, my dad, round of applause for the singers, everybody who came out here. Today? And today is the fifth anniversary of our court case win, so another round of applause.